First off, you looking like you in tremendous shape, man. How many <laughs> minutes could you give the Knicks right now? I had to break those minutes up. I had to break them up into probably 90-second spurts. What was that dynamic like between you and Spree? Well, I think it started off with our, just our competitiveness together. And in practice, we would go at it. How surprised were you about what he was able to do this year? So when he, when he first signed, that's all I could think about, seeing a little Jalen. He, he used to mimic, you know, Spree's move. He used to mimic my move. Well, Fizzles, first of all, Fizzles started on the heels of the relationship with my father, right? And that's where the faith, integrity, sacrifice, leadership, legacy came. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, you're listening to WBH Radio. I'm your host, William Holly, and we have one of my favorite Knicks of all time, two-time All-Star, the great Allen Houston. Thank you for joining me here in studio, sir. In studio. First off, you're looking like you're in tremendous shape, man. How many minutes could you give the Knicks right now? I had to, I had to break those minutes up. I had to break <laughs> them up into probably 90-second spurts. Uh, I, go, I can go probably up and back and up, then that's it. That's then I need it. a break. That's I'm running right to the corner, man. <laughs> <laughs> the game is a lot different today. You know, it's a lot up and down, shooting. The big man's not clogging the paint. What do you think your output would be in today's NBA? You know, I had this conversation twice probably in the last couple of days, one with my son and one with one of the Knicks scouts about today's game. Uh, you know, output, I don't know. I know I shoot more threes. Yeah. Um, but, but I don't know. Like, people talk a lot about, you know, the lack of mid-range – you know, spacing. Mm -hmm. And so you got to think, when, when we played, you have the lanes were a little bit more clogged and mm -hmm. occupied. So you had two bigs kind of were kind of in there and three people on the wing. So you actually had to shoot three, shoot two point shots because as soon as you drove, like you had, to, there was nowhere to really go. Right. Now what has happened since the three point shot, since you know, a lot of uh, spread offense, you know, positionless. You see, you know, what Denver did and you see what, what a lot of people are doing. The floor is spread, you know. So there's more opportunities to, sh to shoot threes. The pace is faster. Yeah, um, yeah I, pr I probably would have shot, you know, I would say at least seven threes yeah. a game probably. You know what I mean? But then you got to look at, like, how, how much would you have been able to exploit at other parts of the game? You know, um, and so there's, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the output would be, but I definitely would have shot more threes. Um, you know, probably would have gotten more shots, more shot attempts yeah. because of the pace, you know. So I don't know how that would look at numbers, you know. thing you got to look at is how many times we've gotten to the free throw line. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's a, that's always a big part of a, 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 a well-balanced diet for scoring. You know, you got to have your – Easy shots, you got your free throws, and then if you're a three-point shooter, then, you know, you just you got to be smart with them. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, you're listening to WBH Radio. I'm your host, William Holly, and we have one of my favorite Knicks of all time, two-time All-Star, the great Allen Houston. Thank you for joining me here in studio, sir. In studio. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, this year, a lot of energy around the Knicks. Uh, what was it like in the garden during the playoffs this year? You know, the, the city yeah. was was really excited about this team specifically? It, it was probably the probably one of the first times in a long time that that it was really anticipated and it lived up to it and it was it was all the above, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I remember in 2012, um, you know, we had Melo and Jason Kidd and 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 that group. Um, you know, we we lost to uh, to Indiana. Um, that was a unique team because we were very, we were older right. and we had a lot of vets and you start to think after that season like is this sustainable mm -hmm. you know then you go back to um the year right when 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 the pandemic kind of started to try to break out and the hawk series and you're like okay this is uh extremely exciting but there was so much just anticipation just because people were trying to just get outside again and right. get in the building and i, I think this year when you look at the makeup of the team, you know, Jalen came in and provided 
some stability and mm-hmm. some leadership and some some dynamics to the to the offense. Um, everybody just kept getting better. Uh, you know, everybody improved. You know, Mitch improved. You know, you you know, Quick improved. You know, Quentin and and um, you know, Obi had. You know, and so you you have to you always have to uh, have the depth, mm-hmm. right? To because it's a long season. Guys gonna get banged up. And guys, sometimes it's not going to be their night. Right. So you have to have that stability. You have to have that depth. So I think when you looked at how that how that played out, um, people were were had a had a level of expectation right. and anticipation that allowed it to be a, for a really exciting, you know, postseason. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I listen to people and I try to have a. Um, a good filter. I learned that from a from a player, but I think people are excited just about we we, we have a, a foundation. Yes, you know to build on. Um, guys are young, uh, you know, but I feel like there's a maturity, there's a there's a character and a depth to the to the personalities on the right. team. Everybody likes to compete. That's you know? a great point because sometimes yeah. you have the youth, but you don't have. The maturity yeah. and the stability. And with Jalen Brunson specifically, mm-hmm. I know you're working in the front office, making these decisions. When the Knicks signed him, like, ah, that's a cool player. Yeah. He was it's great. <laughs> like, yeah. even the, with the playoff series, Eric Spolster, the coach for the Heat, was like, yo, how is this guy not all NBA? How surprised were you about what he was able to do this year with the ball handling, the secure handle, and the scoring that time? You know, you always see someone's capability, you see what they've done in certain situations, mm-hmm. but until they get in this situation, yeah. you just don't know. And so I, I'm not going to say I was surprised. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was pleased that, yeah. hey, because, you know, we, we saw Jalen grow up. Yeah. You know, I, when, when Rick, his father, was on our team, we would see him, like, on the court after games, like, yeah. Imagining being in that moment. That's what I got. To How old was he then? Oh, he was six, seven years old. <laughs> you know, and and it was just like, you see this kid. This is not just a normal like I'm just having fun. Like you could tell he was really imagining himself in these yeah. moments. And so when he, when he first signed, that's all I could think about yeah. seeing little Jalen. He used to he used to mimic, you know, Spree's move. He used to mimic my move. He used to pick a certain move from LJ. He used yeah. to, and and he didn't have a ball in his hand. You wow. know, and he just be out there just going through it. And um, then, you know, knowing Rick, you knew that he was going to have a good mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and his mom, Sandra, they, they, they're, just a, they're just good people. So when you know that they have that foundation, that it's, it's never going to be too much. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think that's, that's important when you look at, you know, where a kid has come from and, and what they've been through. And he's always been that kid that's had to prove something. Yeah, you know when you have that mentality, then that that don't go anywhere. Mm. This team had a lot of people reminiscing about '99, mm. and I, I was definitely one of them. Um, in '99, I was 14. I enjoyed that run you guys had. Uh, AFC going all the way to the finals, first time ever, I believe. A lot of things went on that year. Trades. Injuries, a uh, big shot by you, big shot by uh, LJ. For you, mm. what's your earliest memory of the '99 season? Where does that season begin for you? Because I also I didn't remember it was a lockout year. Yeah, that well, that's where I go back to. I mean, I go back to even to me having surgery on my knee that summer before. Wow. And wondering like, am I going to be full strength even going into the season? Mm-hmm. So when the season got pushed back because of the work stoppage. You know, we didn't start until January. Mm-hmm. So part of me was like, I, I get a little bit more time to, to get my legs under me. Uh, even though I don't know, you know, you're never, you're never fully 100% mm-hmm. when you have a knee surgery like that and come right into the season, mm-hmm. right? I ne- it never dawned on me that I might have to start the season late, you know? So I was always in the mindset of whatever you got to do. So to me, that's where it started. So now we go into January. We're doing these workouts because, you know, you can't work out in your own team facility. So you have to hold it. We had, we had workouts at Manhattan College down in Basketball <laughs> City. And we were just running our own workouts. The players were organizing. Yeah. Yeah. 
and we had some trainers that were there kind of helping. Mm -hmm. But that part was, you know, getting in shape, getting ready, because you knew it was going to be a season. It was going to be a grueling season. We mm -hmm. had three games where we had to play three games in a row. Like, people talk about the back-to-backs. Yeah. What about back-to-back-to-back? -back -to -back? Yeah. Three times. So it's, it's a mental fight mm -hmm. pretty much that whole season. But Spree came in. Spree right? came and in. We, and we, right off the top, we were like, okay, we'll have to figure out how to make this work. But you know you got a dog with you. You know you have, um, you know, we have Marcus Canby. And we knew that the lineup w w was shifting, but we also knew that we had enough. So it's just going to be a matter of how we were going to manage to defend the way we defended right before when we had different players and then play with a little bit more speed. And that was our adjustment. Uh, we had to win six out of eight games just to make the playoffs just to get in. Mm -hmm. So for us, that energy and synergy and, 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 and pressure to win those six games to make the playoffs out of eight games gave us, like when the playoffs started, we were like, all right. Yeah. You know, we, we, we're good. Like, yeah, I've been we in a pressure cooker for the last week or so. We don't feel like an A seed yeah. anyway. Um, and it was so much fun. Like that was our third time playing the Heat. Yeah. And it was just – it was just, you know, I look back at it now and and I appreciate it, but like being in it, it was man, it was it was special, man. It really was. I bet, I bet. A few things before Spree gets traded, he got traded for John Starks. Yeah. Like yeah. you were a little bit broken up about Starks moving on. Well, he was he was he was had a big impact on me, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he was a guy that when I came in. People were expecting us to, you know, go at it, fight for a position, and kind of be it at odds. Mm -hmm. We had, had battles before when I was in Detroit, and he was the first guy that really, like, he showed right away. He showed the culture and leadership, and the winning mindset of a Nick. Wow! Because he came mm -hmm. in before we even played or practiced or worked out together. He was like, "Man, you're gonna be a great Nick, and I'm gonna help you do that." Like. It that that to me still like hearing that is impactful because how many people you know want to carve out their territory in life you know in in their in, in whatever they're doing and have a hard time understanding the bigger picture like we all trying to win right. I'm still gonna compete but my role might change I actually came off the bench um, in the fourth quarters. You know, um, a lot of the first half of that season because Jeff trusted John. Mm -hmm. I started, but in late in those games, you know, so I had to make that adjustment myself to look in the mirror and say, well, look, how can I earn enough trust to do what I need to do to play in the most important part of the game? Right. So I had to learn how to do some things defensively and just make the adjustment. So then we ended up playing together, right? So, um, that's phenomenal. Yeah. That's phenomenal. You signed as a free agent. John right. Starks is a fan favorite. It, it could have been a problem there. And day one, he welcomes you in the fold. Welcomes me in the fold. and then Because I think what happened is he knew that he knew that we were going to end up playing together and mm -hmm. we needed each other. He knew that I needed him because he knew what the battles he had played against were playing against Michael and Reggie <laughs> and, and Mitch Richmond and all these guys. And he knew I hadn't faced that in Detroit yet. Right. So he's like, I'm, I'm going to help you. But he also <laughs> knew that, that he needed me to, to be yeah. there. So, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, he welcomed me. And then, yeah, so when that, when that move came, um, you know, you know the business. It's the yeah. business. And, uh, again, now i got to figure out how to, in, a, in, the same, in, a, in the same way, do the same thing for Spree. Yeah. You know, so I had to come in and say, like, hey, we gonna make this work because it's gonna be hard to guard both of us. Yeah, you two specifically, you and Spreewell, made me a Knicks fan because again, '99, I was 14. That's the first time in my 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 Knicks fandom that we had strong, athletic, kind of like dynamic guards. Starks was the fan favorite, tough, you know, a scrapper. But you guys, the physicality, you know, you with the shooting. What was that dynamic like between you and Spree from a basketball perspective? 
what worked, what were the challenges of you and Spree playing together? Well, I think it started off with our, just our competitiveness mm -hmm. together. And in practice, we would go at it. Yeah. I mean, we would go at it in practice, and, and we loved it. And, and it was intentional. Yeah. And it was intentional not only by Jeff, but we, know we, need, we knew we needed it. Because we knew if we battled in practice, then when we get in the game, it's like there's this bond. And, and so what happened is we would just let the game play out. At certain times, you knew there were certain, certain matchups that we were going to try to, you know, go at. Um, and, and so I think the only thing that we had to figure out is when he gets going, I got to find a way to stay engaged and stay involved just in case now it, it, I get an opportunity. So he was probably better at that because he was such a slasher and he could find a way. I had to kind of figure out, you know, a little bit more like, all right, I want to get. I want him to get off, but I also know I don't want to like you know get uh, lose a rhythm myself. So um, we learn to play off of that, mm -hmm. right? Hey, hey, go run this, run this, you know. So so uh, you know. So we it wasn't like taking turns, but it was almost like playing the game within the game. Mm -hmm. And I think we just we enjoyed that because we just knew it was just really really hard to to deal with both of us. Yeah. It, that 99 season, a lot of questions. Will he start? Will he come off the bench? I think he was starting for a while. Then he, he went down mm -hmm. for a few weeks. And the Knicks decided to bring him off the, the bench when he came back. Yeah. And then he, then he came back, mm -hmm. you know, and, and got back in the lineup. But, like, even those little things, you know, you, it, it's all adjustments, right? right? So there's, like, this balance of doing what you know you can do no matter what, no mm -hmm. matter who's playing. But also understanding there's going to be different. It's like a chess game, right? right? You know, you know this piece can do this every game, but then it's when to do it and how to do it according to your opponent. Mm -hmm. And um, that was that was the beauty of you know, it's the beauty of basketball, right? Yeah. And it's the beauty of 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 a season like that. At the end of the day, it's about preparation. Mm -hmm. And um, I was fortunate to play. You know, for Jeff and his staff, you know, Mike Malone, who's in Denver, you know. The head coach was, of Denver? He was, he was my assistant for a year. Thibodeau was my assistant. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Clifford, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been very fortunate, you know. Don Chaney was my first, you know, coach in, in Detroit. And, you know, he was a Hall of, you know, was Hall of Fame, you know, Hall of Famer. Um, you know, I got to watch and study under Lenny Wilkins and mm – -hmm. And Larry Brown, um, so I've always enjoyed like the coaching process. Right. You know, I see you got the le the eleven rings up here. You got John Wooden up here. You know, and Bill Russell was a player coach. And uh, I don't know. I think just because my father was was my coach, um, I always kind of have you know had this sensitivity to what the coach has to do to prepare, but also be of the personality that you really want to play for and trust. Yeah, yeah. With 99, I, um, the Knicks had the highest payroll in the league at that time. And there was pressures, you know, it was actually a conversation about perhaps Jeff was going to be removed. Mm -hmm. How much do you guys as players feel that pressure from the media? Is it a real thing or the media makes that up and you guys in the locker room are cool? Like, is it real to perceive that that? pressure from the outside that everybody speaks of yeah i mean uh, you you you're aware of it mm -hmm. right and it's like it's like smoke right you you you're aware of it and you might even <laughs> feel it right a little bit but you don't let it really get in your yeah. way you don't let it distract you mm -hmm. um and i think that's the game right mm -hmm. that's the mental game that's the social part of the game and um that's that's where your character and your maturity as we said has to kick in, mm -hmm. you know, because you everything is perspective, right? It's how you perceive. It's not just everything that's happening, but how you perceive what's happening, mm -hmm. and how that impacts what you actually do, how you do it. So when you see pressure and, you know, this idea that we didn't have social media back then, right. but New York was the biggest media market, so it felt 
similar mm -hmm. because anything you did or said was going to be just blown, you know, it's going to be blown out of proportion. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you, I think Jeff and, and, and we try to do a good job of saying, hey, let's keep it in here. Yeah. We, we're, we're in here and everything else is out there. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of one of the ways we just, we kind of kept everything in house and, um, that was our mentality. You played at the University of Tennessee. Finished your career at that time, all-time leading scorer, 89 to 93. Yeah, I don't think that's going to get cracked because these guys are going to leave early. They're yeah. going to leave too early. That's your record. <laughs> it's Allen Houston's record. Uh, I had no idea that the head coach was your father, Wade yeah. Houston. What was that like, Mr. Allen Houston, playing big-time college basketball for your father? Well, it all started, you know, when I, from, from the, as young as I can remember, right? I mean, I learned to walk on a basketball court. Basketball was like, it was in our family, it was in our blood. You know, my, my grandfather on my mother's side is one of the, probably one of the, could go down as the winningest or the best high school coach in Kentucky high school basketball history, wow. right? Before integration. Um, you won four or five Negro championships, football, basketball. Then, you know, my father ends up uh, getting the head coach. Well, he became one of the first black assistant coaches. He became the first class of black scholarship basketball players at Louisville in 1962. He was in that first class. Yeah. So Louisville and being a pioneer and, and the heritage of, you know, what he's done – way before I even thought about playing the NBA is there. So then my, my you, know, um, he, you know, he went to four Final Fours as an assistant coach at Louisville. Uh, they won two national championships mm -hmm. when he was assistant coach. So by the time I was a senior in high school, I knew I was going to Louisville. He was a senior. Like, <laughs> people would people were recruiting me and calling the house. Like, you could tell in their voice, like, I'm just got to make this call, man. Yeah. And I know, you know. I know you're going to go play out of respect, your dad. Yeah. Out of respect. I did. All right, so that conversation, those conversations were like 30 seconds. Wow. Signed with Louisville in November. No transfer portal, none of that. Yeah. He gets a job in that following April and becomes the first black coach in SEC history. Wow. Um, at that time, there were, you know, maybe John Thompson, um, Leonard Hamilton, I think, um, Rudy Washington. They weren't. There was a handful of, of black coaches. Right. They start and they had to start a black coaches association, yeah. so that other coaches, black assistants, would even get interviewed. Mm -hmm. So, knowing coming in that this was really not so much about, you know, me shattering records and you know how fast can I get to the NBA? It, it really wasn't even about that. It was like I was you know, bringing something and carrying something that was way bigger than me. You know, he grew up 15 minutes from the campus. Mm -hmm. And so we had family. I might have had more family at the games in Knoxville <laughs> than I had in Louisville, <laughs> than I would have had in Louisville, you yeah. know, just because just that's where my we grew up and my dad grew up, so we would come in the summers. So it was a real homecoming right. on top of the historic, you know, magnitude of, of it. I mean, what it was like was because sometimes we see today like it, it can be unhealthy. Pet, it can be healthy a lot. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure it would have worked if I had done it sooner. You know what I mean? Like in high school or something? Yeah, I think I think at the time it worked because, you know, he the moment of him being, you know, a pioneer coach and being somewhere outside of, of Louisville and us moving, coming together, um, you know, me coming in as a freshman, not really knowing a lot of the other guys, I, it forced me to, to – I would I was always like this. I wanted to prove my work, prove your worth, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to come in and assume anything, you know. So my biggest thing was be humble and hardworking. That was what I got. Be humble, work hard. You know, you're never, you're never bigger than anything, any moment. 
but you're also going to be the hardest worker. So that was my mentality no matter what. So I think what that does is no matter where you are, you kind of gain some respect in doing that just alone. Mm -hmm. And I needed, for me, I wanted to have the respect of my teammates because I didn't want, I wanted to be, that's this is what it is. Sports is like a meritocracy, right? Yes. You 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 earn your minutes, you earn your spot, or somebody's gonna bust you and take take your spot. Yes. You know. So to me, it was like I, didn't, I needed it to be that way. I want to talk about your brand, social impact brand, Fishu. Yeah. F I S L L. <laughs> um, you got a lot of things going on. The first thing I saw when I went to the website, you have some clothing. Yeah. And with the clothing. You are allowed to use NBA team logos. Mm -hmm. When I saw that, I said, "Oh, Allen Houston is doing business, business," yeah. because that's not easy, yeah. you know, to get that team licensing. How did how did that yeah. come about? Well, Fizzles, first of all, Fizzles started on the heels of the relationship with my father. Right? We, I got, when I got to the NBA, I just appreciate appreciated even more. I guess just talking to your teammates and seeing now that you're you're a grown man, and you you're seeing people with their kids. Your teammates are with their kids, and right. you you see this role of a father in a whole different way. And it just hit me, man. Like, man, I, I it really hit me how much I appreciated how he prepared me for this, and the principles and the lessons that an example he was as a mm -hmm. as a godly man, you know. So we just started doing these these retreats and workshops and and just engagements around fatherhood and building young men and teachers showing them like these are principles and the example and, and and the fathers got to see how impactful their role is just through basketball right so i wrote the five words down because i wanted the takeaway to be not just the experience and saying man i got to see alan and his dad and but what's some things i can remember and they could take away me that i can apply to my life every day right and that's where the faith, integrity, sacrifice, leadership, legacy came. So Fizzle was born way before it had NBA marks on it. <laughs> Fizzle was, was, was a mindset and a movement way before you could see it on a, on a piece of apparel. Mm -hmm. Had a chance to go do, do a licensing deal with the NBA, you know, um, and got the license. And we were able to create like a pathway where you know, when you see apparel and uh, so many people are doing fashion apparel yes. and, and merchandise, and I didn't see the explosion of all this then, this is 2017. Um, I just wanted a way to express these words, man. That's really what it came down to. And at the time, the, the, the open lane was you can get an NBA license and you can take some nice uh, – fabric and apparel and merchandise and create a fashion version of team apparel. So now we're in 50 colleges. We got our HBCUs. We have the WNBA. Mm -hmm. We have college. I mean, we have NBA. Um, but the biggest thing for me is, you know, what we wear really is an outer expression of what we feel about ourselves on the inside. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I want the brand to be like. That's what we call, we, we say win from within, mm -hmm. right? You, everybody wants to win in life. And I found that what we all are really looking for is that meaning and that purpose. And like, what am I really here for? And how well can I do it? And can I accomplish it? Well, you need a strategy. You need tools. You know, you need a playbook. Yeah. You, you need preparation and you need a coach. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a, really a life coaching and leadership development platform that promotes these values um, and experience. So you need something tangible. When you talk about a brand that's trying to make an impact, right. you need something tangible that people can experience or wear or, you know, or, or attach themselves to. And uh, so I, I'm like, well, okay, apparel's one, but we're also creating, you know, same thing, we're creating conf content, conversations yeah. like we're doing here with, with young leaders um, and, and really giving them what they need on the inside for success. The clothing was just a way to get your message out. That's why I, I like you describe it as a social impact brand. Yeah. You know, and these five words are very important to you. Faith, integrity, sacrifice. Leadership, leadership and, legacy. and legacy. 
You have a book that is associated with it, uh, The Fundamentals of Life. I was yeah. fortunate to have an advanced copy. And what I enjoyed most is, again, you talk about the tools within. Yeah. That's going to lead to the success. Yeah. But it first starts with uh, your qualities and values yeah. within. And that started with your dad. You, you said something I think is important is that these the quality, your inner qualities are what lead to success. Mm -hmm. And I think what we try to do is, is start off in our programming. It really is helping people go through this process, mm -hmm. right? It's like, how do you make these values and characteristics aspirational and tangible, mm -hmm. right? How, how can I make faith like something I really want? How can I make integrity something I really want? It's not sexy. It's not. You know, it's not the first thing that comes to your mind is like I want to do the right thing. Right. You know. It's you know. I want to give myself <laughs> up. Right. I want to be. That's not the first thing that I think we come out thinking. But it's an evolution of ourself. But we have to have some type of pers higher perspective. So I kind of look at our programming and the and the leaders who uh, facilitate the programming as like they're like. You, know, you ever been to the Empire State Building, right? Yeah. And that guy who takes you up the elevator, standing there, and he's and he's and he's taking you up, and he's just, you know, watching the process. And before you know it, you're like, "Dang, look how high I am!" Yeah. And you can see so much from that point of view. And it's almost like we just want to take people to a higher level of thinking mm -hmm. and a higher level of being, so that they can operate in whatever realm they are, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, yeah, the programming looks a lot like, you know, in, engaging a young person with a trust, trusted, credible adult. So if you think about young people, right, especially yes, now, who do they trust? <laughs> like w through the pandemic, think about how many parents and coaches and leaders we we are going through it. Yeah. So how can we go through it and be able to equip our young people if we're still trying to figure out the trauma? And and so even before that. We still need development, right? Coaches need coaches. They do, Mr. right? Yeah. So we have to be, look at ourselves as adults and be accountable, so we can be the best for our young people. So it really is kind of going back to that relationship. It's a relationship building process where you can give a young person or a leader, hey, these are the tools you're gonna need. First of all, to define success before you achieve success, because my my Success may not be yours. Yours may not be mine. Right. I got to, this is what's, what's out for me. I'm not trying to be somebody I'm not, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I wanted to compete against MJ, but I wasn't MJ. Mm -hmm. I wasn't anybody but me. And what I'm trying to do is win as it has been defined and chosen for me. Right. And how do you do that? Well, you believe in yourself, right? You have a positive expectation. You know, you go about it the right way because there's there's value in doing things the right way. If there's a way to do it, then that's what my grandfather would always say. Yeah. You know, when you come to sacrifice, you can't get anything worth in life without giving. You just can't, you know. And that's, without but paying that's, the price, yeah. You can't pay. You got to pay the price, man. <laughs> you know, you got to die to yourself to yeah. gain, you know. Yeah. And, and the leadership and the legacy are, are, are complementary because a lot of people, I think they want the the glamour of leadership, but they don't understand the servanthood and and the the investment um, in other people to lead, right? And then legacy is more than just the, the you know rings. Yeah, you know what I mean. Legacy is not just a physical thing. It's hey, it's it, it's just I tell people like when I'm talking to them, I can tell when a young person really is taking in just by the way they look listening. Yeah. Forget about any conversation we had. I can say by the way you're listening and looking to me, I can tell if it's going in. Yeah. That's to me, that's legacy. Just just like it doesn't have to be this grandiose conversation or achievement. It could just be one little thing, right, that that impacts, you know, the rest of somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And so Oh, that's the mission, man. It's, it's really spreading that message, you know. And it's um, something that is very important to you. I, I've, I've seen it, watching yeah. from afar. You know, this is, uh, as you said, these are the values that have been instilled from 
uh, your father. One right. key piece I thought very important for defining success. Yeah, a lot man. of people, especially today with the social media, they looking at somebody else's life and they think yeah. they got no shot or they're, they're not going to make it. You said, hey, I wasn't MJ, but I, I, I'd handle my business. Yeah, you know I, what I'm saying? I, was try- I wanted to be me. Think about, like, people talk a lot about, like, let's the, the, the Miami shot. I get reminded of that shot, right? Well, there are four people, three people that didn't touch the ball, yeah. right? And four people didn't get the shot, right? But they all had a role. And, and then maybe in the play before that, my job was to set a screen and just get out of the way. Right. In basketball, when I make a pass, the worst thing I can do is stand in the same place that I just stood. Mm. When I make a pass, my job now is to get out of the way so that person who I made the pass to has an option. Mm -hmm. For that play, that was success for me. I did my job. Right. I think Mike Tomlin has something in the locker room. Do your job. That's success. But we want to look at success in so many different ways. I got to have this. I got to achieve this. Well, why don't you just be this first, right? And then you can do this. And then the rest, you know, the rest comes from that. That's pretty cool. One of the biggest shots of your career, you can acknowledge the role your, your teammates play. Somebody had to set that the position. pick. That's phenomenal. Like, some people, That's a somebody, somebody yeah. had to set the pick <laughs> and execute. We didn't have a timeout. And I love talking about it because not about the shot, what happened after the shot. I like to talk about the process, mm. you know, that went into the shot because everybody has a role. How long has these values been a part? Are you been aware of Good question. these are the values that have drove me to this point? When that, did you first come aware? Man, that's a great question. And I don't know if I have a, 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 a time, but... Um, the good thing about Fizzle is it does bring you to a level of consciousness and awareness. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I've always, my family's always been a family of faith. You know, growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, you know, it's kind of part of the culture. Yeah. But at some point, you got you to gotta define what you believe for yourself, mm-hmm. who you believe in, and, and why. And um, I think from a faith perspective, I think it probably happened when I was around 14 or 15. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we would just be in church and you know as a teenager you're like all right we're in the church and you know here we go and but I felt something different man I felt like it's almost like you know when you're on the bench and you just like man I'm not playing and then the coach looks down and you meet eyes and it's like oh okay I'm about to go in yeah and that's what it felt like when I was 14 I felt like Lord was like hey man it's time to go Mm -hmm. like you have these talents and you know, you're growing fast and you got these little girls, you know, look, it's time to go. It's time to do something for me now, right? It's right. not this, man. So I answered the call and it was it was by faith that, you know, I just said, look, whatever you want, I'm ready, you know, and you take your bumps and bruises and, you know, you make your mistakes and you learn from them. But I think faith came there and I think... um I think integrity, I would say, I don't know, maybe in my, in, in college probably when, you know, you're playing for your dad and you become, you know, aware of, hey, man, you're, this is, you're the coach's son. You can't be going out wilding out on campus all the, the time. Boss. You got to be really yeah. careful. Yeah. I'm 20 years old, 19 years old, so I ain't going to, you know, I'm still going to be a teenager, you know what I mean? Right. But I, I just was like, kind of like always kind of like, you know, conscious. Yeah. I think sacrifice probably came more when when I was uh probably more aware of it probably in marriage. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like sacrifice is you know that that that's a relationship that is like no other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, in marriage you just like it makes no rhyme or reason but I'm giving myself you know to this person beyond my comfort zone but beyond my desires it's just because i i I, it's what i'm to do i'm to sacrifice i'm to give and um that's a that's a a team also like being on the knicks like being the nba you and your spouse yeah is a team sacrifice is very important it's and you can't win without it you can't (laughs) 
I mean, think about if you're a great team, if you're a good team, first of all, a great team, if you're a good team, you're going to have good players to play with you, yeah. right? Yeah. How are you going to be a really good team with, with a bunch of bad players? Mm -hmm. So if you're on a good team, you're going to have other good players that you're playing with. Right. That means those other good players are going to have to eat too. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got to win. Everybody's got to eat. So how can I eat and, and, and give myself so that person can eat? Because we want to win together, or you may you just want you might just want to win on your own terms, which really don't mean you want to win. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I see that. You know, people are like I want to win, but like, man, you know, you won, but then you're looking at the stats. You're like, yeah, man, they ain't willing to pay the price. Yeah, like no, it's not about that, man. There's a, there's one letter Definitely. that matters after the games, right? Because mm -hmm. what I learned in being the gen general manager of the G League team, right? is that even in the G League, when your team is winning, everybody looks good. Yeah. Right? You may be like, man, he's getting called up. That person's getting looks. But guess what? When you win, there's a certain environment that you contributed to. Yeah. And people see that. People notice that. You know, and I think so. You're right. Like, sacrifice and winning go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And um, you have an app for Fizzle. Yeah, yeah. How did that come about? That's not well, easy. Well, that's that has been probably the thing that has taken the the longest to develop because technology changes and you're trying to find your. My goal was to was to have a place where these conversations and context around just winning in life can happen, and it can be a safe place and people can get it, get it and resource it, you know. And so. Uh, Probably by the 4th of July, we'll come out with our next version mm -hmm. and, you know, really looking forward to getting kind of like this content and this these creative flows, right, of, of life through the lens of some of our young people um, and leaders and thought leaders. We have we have um, health care providers and hospitals that are really looking at how we can collaborate with youth, mental health, and faith, kind of how they all combine. Um, because, again, you know, I have seven children, and we are always constantly talking about these conversations sure. and how they apply, like getting into college and, you know, being a good teammate, being a good friend. What happens when this friend tells you something and you're not supposed to tell anybody else and, you know, your teacher – it, there's so many of these dynamics, man, that happen in life, and it, it's like because of the world and social media and and all the things that are thrown at us and our young people, we have to have a filter somewhere. Yeah. Like we have to have a, a healthy way to like what's good and what's not for me. Right. And uh, and and part of it is just talking to people. You know what I mean? And and sharing. And you know, a lot of people are going through trauma, right? And people, you know, are lost. And so, how you get built up and 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 sturdied is through community. So that's that's one of the things is just having a community of people who are really about these values man, and and uh, want to want to level up in life, um, and 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 give them the tools. How old is your oldest child? Twenty four. And the youngest? Eleven. So that's a nice wide spectrum. Yeah, no twins, five girls. So you're dealing with all different aspects of kind of like youth life. Yeah. You got people going into college. You got prom. You got graduation. You yeah, got all of it. So you seeing Teams. all of it. Yeah, I mean. So it makes sense why you want to equip. Like a coach wants to equip his players with the tools right. to go. Just like a parent, I want to give them a a a a set of tools that they can rely on when they go out in the world yeah. when mom and dad is not there or coach is not That's there. That's right. I mean, think about a coach you, you've played for, a coach that we've played for, right? Mm -hmm. You remember something they said or a philosophy, yeah. terminology mm -hmm. that, that stuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like one thing I like what, what Tib says a lot is, you know, you know, trust your work. Mm -hmm. Trust your work. How many, how many of us try to prepare for a presentation, a speech, a game, a test, mm -hmm. and we get all, like, stressed out. And and it's like, but you, have you put the work in? That's it. Okay, if you put the work in, then you're prepared. 
And some people may feel like, man, I'm, I'm prepared. Some people are like, nah, I, I want to put more in. Some over-prepared, fine. You cannot go into that situation feeling like I didn't do whatever I could do. And so, yes, that's that. As a parent, as a coach, as a executive yeah. CEO, <laughs> I feel like your legacy is what did you equip people with so they could go on and be better, right? When they leave your situation, think about the coaching tree. You look at John Wood, and he goes, you know, Denny Crum. Denny Crum came on, and you know, Pat Riley, and then you got Jeff Van Gundy. You got all these Mike Malone. Like, what did what did he equip people with? Yeah that they could take it and, and move forward with it. A few things from the career. Um, yeah. The shot. You mentioned the shot. I watched it a hundred times last <laughs> night in preparation for the uh, um, interview. What's that like, man? It's you the eighth seed. You're knocking off the number one seed with this shot. Um, the, the arena goes silent. I just remember you running all the way, fist clenched. Cheeks puffed, <laughs> throw that 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 fist in the air. What was that like? Man, it was so much, you know, emotion. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, it was accumulation of all the years, the work. I think most of all, it was it was that it was Miami. It was that battles we had. You know, you think about the '97 when we should have should have we were up three yeah. one. You know, and you think about the following year, uh, you know, when we when we beat them. And it's just the intensity of the moment, man, you know, and it's New York. And then fans, there were New York fans in Miami's arena. Always. Always. <laughs> and um, it's just uh, – and then we were, we were like mirror images of each other. Yeah. You know, we, we, re we were like brothers playing against brothers. Mm -hmm. And – and um, every possession was like the last one. Mm -hmm. You know, it felt like every possession felt like the last possession. Yeah. You know, that's how the games were played. And um, and you know, it was the we we, we were the AC. There was mm -hmm. so much that was going against you. Yeah. You know, but then uh, you know, and I I felt like at the end of the regular season we had a shot. Um, that I think I had a put back that didn't count mm -hmm. because we didn't have the instant replay then. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, man, that I don't really believe in karma. I don't like <laughs> believe that word, but it's like I think that was like kind of payback. Yeah. You know. You never played for Raleigh. Never. Ewing and them had a disdain for the heat, for like feeling spurned by Raleigh. And you you weren't under that tutelage. So how do you like inherit that kind of bad blood or uh, animosity towards the heat? I don't even know if it was animosity towards the heat. It was just competitive spirit. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, uh, because we were so similar. Yeah. I think, you know, you, it's almost like you look in yourself in the mirror, like, how can I beat myself? Yeah. And I think that's what it felt like sometimes. We just had different, you know, makeup. And, man, listen, playing, playing in the playoffs in New York, I mean, the first playoff series – you know, was I think my first playoff series was was um, I'm in Charlotte, mm -hmm. and um, man, I just remember it, man. It was just like you couldn't even really imagine the feeling of coming. Say now we're in the playoffs yeah. in New York, right? And that's where it's what you live for. Yeah. And uh, so it was like it was Miami, but it's really just now that this moment is here that you've been mm -hmm. waiting for. As you guys moved along, uh, unfortunately, Patrick, you on with Terry's Achilles. Yeah. You know, you had these big moments, and then here, the big man goes down. What was that like in the locker room? It was tough to see someone who put so much into it. Um, because, man, there were times when Patrick would, we would be like, man, it's a big fella, man. You don't need to practice with <laughs> it, man. Just, but he, he didn't want to miss practice. He didn't want to miss workouts. And that, that, damn, man, it just set such a, a tone for all of us. So when you see, you see him go down, you're like, listen, we got to pick him up. We got to pick him up. You and know, he built, he built, you know, we felt like he built this building. Yeah. You know what I mean? In, my, in our eyes. And we hadn't, you know, experienced the history of Willis and Clyde and, mm -hmm. and, and Earl, but 
in in our eyes, like big fella, like put his work in. So, you know, it was it was that, and then it was also like, look, man, like this is what you're here for. Mm-hmm. This is your time now. You have to do step up, next man up. And there's part of you as a competitor that's like, all right, now this is an opportunity. And um, so we 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 took both of those kind of mindsets and just put them together. That's a phenomenal part of the story. The the captain, your general goes down, and you guys were able to pick yourself up off the mat against the bitter rivals, the Pacers. Yeah. Like that when I when I went back and looked at everything that took place in '99, I'm like, yo, this can't be forgotten. And for y'all to proceed and keep going forward, beat the Pacers, go into the finals, well, you know, that's was, some character, Mr. Houston. It was character, and there was a lot of competitiveness in our own self that people, a lot of people are like, man, now you can play a different way that you hadn't been able mm-hmm. to play. And so we were like, all right, we got to make this work. Yeah. Because if people were saying, y'all need to play faster, well, guess what? Now you have to. You know, and it's just one of those things where now you 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 didn't ask for it, but you know what? You always wondered, okay, if we could play a certain way, would it work? Well, now we gotta make it work. Now you gotta make it work at the most important time of the year. You know, um, LJ had to step up and play his, uh, undersized for f- yeah. small four. He was battling injuries. I just look back at that team with a, a level of fondness, you know, from my perspective as a fan, like these guys put it together. And, and you know, we looked around, when you look around the locker room and your team, and you're like, he can play. Yeah. Kirk Thomas led, lead, led the nation in, <laughs> in scoring and rebounding. Yeah. Marcus Cameron's number one pick. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we got players that could play. It wasn't like, you know, we were like, oh, man, like Patrick – was big fella, but we looked around like, now nah, we we can play, and we believed in that. Mm-hmm. As a fan, the fond memories, eighth seed, overcome um, adversity to make it all the way to the finals. We look back with great fondness. You as a player, though, somebody that was in the trenches fighting for that championship. When you look back on that that year, uh, what are your feelings now? The, the ninety nine year, yes, sir. Um, Obviously, disappointment that you didn't, you weren't able. Like you never want, you don't want to see anybody celebrate on your floor. You don't. You do. You do. I always say this too. When 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 sports seasons end, right? There's one team that's happy. Yeah. There's only one team that's happy at the end of the season, right? So all the work that everybody puts in, you can you can feel good about, you know, or bad about, but that one team is the one team. So that, but man, just just the journey. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like to say that you got to play in the finals mm-hmm. in Madison Square Garden, you know, for the Knicks in that era, and um, you know, make that run was it was memorable, man. Like you don't get that far, you know, without. Some really, really hard. I mean, look, look at the just take the heat this year. Yeah. Right? How many people are like, man, man, they tough, you know, and blah 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 blah, and you know, they got past us, and then they he went on and you know got past Boston. It's like, whoa, man, like so just that journey of knowing what you can accomplish. Yeah. Um, it 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 shows you something. Nineteen ninety two dream team. Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Carl Malone, Charles Barkley, and a host of others. Uh, many believe the greatest collection of basketball talent. Right? I'm not going to argue with that. There's a, a story out there that in, in uh, the preseason, they played against a bunch of college kids, and they lost. Now, I know Bob Hurley. Uh, no, Danny Hurley. Bobby. Bob Hurley was on that team. Yeah. Uh, Grant Hill was on that team. Chris Webber, Penny Hardaway. Was Allen Houston on that team? Yes, <laughs> yes, sir. Wow, I, yeah. I just learned that recently. Yeah, yeah. Take so. us. What happened in that that scrimmage? <laughs> well, uh, first time they had brought you know some young bucks <laughs> in, and '92. The idea was that we need. There's going to be a different way we're going to need to learn how to play. They were going to have to play against some European guys and just a different flow, and they figured. 
to bring some young players that we don't really know much. Of. We haven't played against them a lot. I mean, we, a lot of us have played against them, and like I played against you know Michael in in college and in his camp, and, you know, different things like that. But never in a situation like mm -hmm. this, you know. So um, truly unforgettable, man. I mean, we. <laughs> We walk. We we had kind of been together for three days. Where was this? In La Jolla, California, okay. right outside of San Diego. Yeah. So we we we're in there, and finally, it was almost like you're going to see the wizard, right? We're sitting here going on this journey, and in the third day, we finally get to actually go see them. <laughs> so we walk in the gym, and it's just it's just crazy, man. You see these guys together, let alone battling against each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about they David and Patrick and. Charles and Bird and Clyde and and Michael and 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 Magic and it's like Stockton. They all just like just going at each other, man. And and um, and Carl Malone and Pip. And every play is like a highlight, but not like a highlight where it's an All Star game where people are letting them do whatever. Like no, they're going at it, yeah. right? And we're like, all right, well, so we're here to come to do. <laughs> what so, year were you in? You were a junior. I was a junior. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> threw us in there, man. And and the and the the idea was that, you know, you guys are gonna have to, you're not gonna run out of plays, right? Yeah. You're gonna zone them and you're not gonna run a lot of plays. We just want you to just play free, drive, kick, don't overthink it. You right? Just play off your instincts. And and that's what we did, and and it was like, I think because we weren't out there thinking, we were just balling, right? And um, they didn't know what we were doing either. They were just like, man, these young kids. But we were we got some pretty good players on that team, and um, we just caught a stretch, man. Where you know how it is when you catch a rhythm, and we started popping off some threes, and um, and we were zoning them, so they were just, you know. Who knows, like, what was going on in their head, but... Who you, know, you matched up against? Well, we were playing zone most okay. of the time, so it's kind of like... But I know Pip was guarding me some. I figured that um, was what they put on you. Yeah. Um, Drexler? Uh, it was mostly it was mostly Pip, and and, and um, I think they had them playing a little bit of zone, too, so okay. it's like it was just trying to feel it out. It was like an experimental process, right? But, yeah, I mean... You know, they, they stopped the clock and and, and everybody kind of got silent and, and we were we were up and I'm, and and it was like one of the things, well, wait a minute, are we are we gonna keep playing we gonna keep playing or you know what's going what's happening, right? Play a few more minutes and then you know, Chuck Daly just shut it down, we'll come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I don't remember the score, but all I know is, you know, there was there was some trash talking, you know back at the hotel and so much that when we came back the next day it was it was a different ball game. Yeah. It was a little different next <laughs> the next day. But we enjoyed that for a moment, man. It was it was um the thing I remember most about that to be honest was not even that. It mm -hmm. was like going in a guy's room, you know, watching them play cards, watch mm -hmm. how to interact, just seeing the stuff they had. You know, everybody had their own special USA version of their shoes and yeah. They gave us some shoes. I still got some Ewings back in my home, back oh, in my house in oh. Louisville. And um, like it was really that playing golf with them, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And you know, almost falling off the golf cart. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, just seeing the the the, the life, you know, yeah. that and I remember Chris Webb and we would look at each other and we we'll watch <laughs> them playing cards, like, yo, man, this is crazy. And 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 I was thinking, I remember him saying, man, this 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 gonna be us one day, yeah. right? And I I never forget that, you know, that just being able to, like, touch to feel it and touch yeah. it, you know. Did that lead you to kind of turn things up in your own game? What impact did that have on you with the basketball player? Um, I think it definitely gave you yeah. some confidence. It gave you like, okay, when you when you play like that against them and you have that experience, mm. you. To me, you have to guard being a little too too overconfident, right? right? So to me, it was like, man, I'm just gonna keep putting in this work. And uh, after my junior year, I had already thought about, you know, uh, should I should I leave? Yeah. And um, I came back, you know, wanted to come back and play my senior year because my father was my coach, yeah. and you know, uh, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Thursday night is draft night. 
a lot of young men's lives are about to change. What was your draft night experience like? Um, I kind of had an idea where I was going to go, which, which, you know, where I was going to land. Um, I think at the time it was anywhere from 8 to 12 or 13. Okay. Um, but it was exciting because it was in Detroit. Oh, and uh, Detroit had the tenth and the eleventh pick, so they get to they get to nine. Uh, think eight, nine was uh, I think Rodney Rogers. Think eight was Ben Baker. Um, and then they get to ten, and they had ten and eleven. So I'm like, okay, they got two picks. So I'm thinking they might. I'm, I'm I wonder what's going to happen here. Yeah. So they pick Lindsey Hunter, number ten. I'm like, hmm, they pick Lindsey, okay. Then they pick me number 11. And, um, you know, I just remember giving my grandfather a big hug, you know, and then my dad and my grandparents. And and this next thing was, like, I'm in the palace in Detroit, you know. Yeah. Like, you always think, like, they go, how how they going to react? Sure. It was a good reaction, and it was just, um, yeah, man, I was I was happy, man. It was it was. Just being able to be drafted right there too, because usually the draft is now in this one place every yeah. year. But yeah, it was it was great being in Detroit. Um, you know, met my wife. You know, um, you know, soon after, and uh, it's been a blessing, man. You know, Detroit has always been, you know, a place that I give a lot of credit to helping me. You know, almost raised me in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. When you were courted by the Knicks, you remember mm. that that period? Yeah. Some of the things they put together? Yeah. What was that like? Because uh, yeah. I was reading something, and you mentioned it here, that it was a foregone conclusion that you were going to play for your dad at yeah. the college level. Yeah. So this was kind of like your first real yeah. recruitment. Yeah. And the Knicks pulled out all the stops. What was that yeah. like? Yeah, yeah. That's true. A lot of people don't know that, that the assistant general manager uh, at the time – was a guy named Ed Tapscott. Mm-hmm. He was a, he was assistant GM, and he was a good friend of my dad's, and knew a lot of the coaches, and been on a recruiting circuit in college. You know, when my dad was there, and um, you know, he he knew that that I hadn't been recruited a lot, so you know, he pulled it out. They had um, they had a video they put together of a lot of the stars and the, sit on the front row and say, "Alan, you know, we we you need to be here. You need to be in New York." They had this mock up of Something on Times Square of me in some shorts, you know, mm-hmm. all my shirt off and, you know, all this stuff. And it and was. And this is like before Photoshop was a big deal. Yeah, like they put man, some work into they it. They put work into it, man. And they, and they, I mean, they, they said they, they put, they, um, at the time it was, you know, Dave Checkins and Ernie Grunfeld. They picked me up in this limo and we, we drove around these homes up in Greenwich, Connecticut, wow. man. And I'm like, what is this place, man? You know what I mean? Like I'm from Louisville, go to Detroit, and then you go up to, you know, see these mansions and not, not even mansions, they were estates. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it was like, um, just, you know, on top of that, I, I guess the part of it that really got me was obviously the money was good, mm-hmm. but you know, you you just have a genuine feeling that. They value you mm-hmm. to help them go to the next level, mm-hmm. right? That to me was what I felt, you know. And maybe because I hadn't been through that process a lot, like you talk to people enough, you feel like okay, they this is the situation they're in. They're already here, and they feel like you're kind of like a piece yeah. to getting them to that next level. I think that meant a lot to me, as like okay, I like. Now you're back. Now they almost like they're putting it back on you. Yeah. Like, do you believe th- that you can help us get to this chip? Yeah. You know, and I think that that part of the challenge was as big as anything. I saw. I read someone also that you, when you got on the plane, they had a version of your jersey hanging over every seat, like an Allen Houston Knicks well, they, jersey. <laughs> what they what they did? They had a jersey made up because <laughs> Chris Childs was. Uh, we we rode on the plane together, okay. and they had our jerseys made up. <laughs> I was like, dang, this is crazy. Like, I, I trying to envision like a real, you know, back then, like it was just, you just didn't see that a lot, right? Mm-hmm. 
and framed and everything. And and then you walk into the locker room and they had a big trophy, like right, oh, right, wow. right there, you know. And um, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, I want honeymoon. So we had just got married in August. Now, this is uh, this is you know after. I just got married in August, and on a honeymoon, they sent this gift, right? And my wife was like, oh, that is really nice, really thoughtful. And they sent this gift. The gift was like a 20 by 30 poster of the championship trophy. Wow. <laughs> like, so, so it was like a nice gift, but it was just like, wow. Like, this was, my wife was like, okay, they, they serious about yeah. this, you know? Um, but, like, little things like that, you know, back then, I think, meant, it just meant a lot. You know, it meant a lot to say this is what you're a part of. This is what this is what we believe we can do with you. When I read that, I'm like, wow, man, that's top notch. Yeah, that's top yeah. notch. Yeah. And now you're part of that process when it comes to bringing in new folks to the organization. So you know what it takes to put some cool things together for these guys. But now it's everybody's kind of blowing the budget. Really, yeah. I mean, now now I think people people know. Kind of what they want, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Now I think because of social media, because of the the relationship they have with each other, um, they have a little bit better idea. Yeah. And 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 I would say a lot of it is you know, it's more about the basketball. To be honest, I believe mm -hmm. like what situation is is really going to be best for me. Money is always going to be, right. you know. But like, you know. You're looking at the coach, the culture. You're looking at players who you're gonna, you know, be around. Yeah. Like, um, there's no place like playing in New York. Yeah, there's there's no place like it. And you just want to be in a situation where New York can uh, can really not just boost you up, but you know, the winning part is really what what can be offered. Mr. Allen Houston, I know you got to go. I appreciate you uh, being here, not only on my show, but in studio. Yes, sir. This is phenomenal. Please let us know one last mm -hmm. time how we can support your brand, your movement, Fizzle. I have a few good young men. We'll be wherever you need us to be. Let, let us know. Well, how, how can the, we, well, the people, support you? All right, man. First of all, I appreciate you. You know, um, just just what you're doing, man. Your energy, your, your investment, commitment to yourself, man. You know, it's you could tell it's real. Um, and I feel like I'm in the same situation, man. Like you know, I, I, I've I've been very fortunate, but building, you know, your brand, building yourself up, man. That's a that's a it's a deep and long suffering endeavor, man. Yes, you know, and so um, that's why I wanted to come, man, and be here and support because I know what it is, and I think it's. And just spread the message, man. Fizzle, you know, um, we we have a campaign that we're about to launch going into summer league called Win From Within. Okay. And it's a, just hashtag Fizzle, hashtag Win From Within. Um, and we're going to be pushing out more. We're going to get more ambassadors to get involved, mm -hmm. you know, get people to, like, really be involved with the process of of talking about this conversation, what these five words really can do in your life, you know, and testify to it. Um, but yeah, hashtag fizzle, half win from within. And we're going to have uh, some campaigns, some things we're going to do this summer that are pretty exciting. All right, brother. We are behind you. Yeah. And we appreciate you uh, a great deal. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Alan Houston, I'm William Holly, WBH Radio. Out.